Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Hi, how are you? I'm good. I was about to introduce you to the class. So I will do it in Italian very briefly and then uh, I'll give you the, the word. Ah, hello. Okay. Thank you to be here anyway. Thanks for having me. Um, quindi vi dicevo questo agliotto tarazza che vedete in video è una mia vecchia conoscenza, è un ragazzo che ha studiato allo IED e um, nasce come fotografo di moda e ho pensato di invitarlo su, per, per ispirarvi in questa riflessione sui corpi e sull'uso sull'uso del corpo, sul significato del corpo, sulla relazione che il corpo ha con il mondo esterno e anche sul... ma ho pensato a lui soprattutto inizialmente per, per un lavoro che lui aveva fatto all'inizio della sua carriera con Melissa Baumeister che è una stilista in modo che conosciamo. E quindi riteniamo interessante il suo lavoro formale e esplorativo rispetto alle forme, al corpo, e dove il corpo inizia e dove il corpo finisce però poi eh, la sua ricerca è andata molto oltre questo aspetto e quindi lui ora si è occupato, occupato per tanto tempo di fotografia, si occupa anche di video, poi racconterà meglio lui che cosa fa, e, però diciamo che la sua ricerca in questa direzione è, è andata veramente molto oltre la, la sintesi formale che, che aveva esplorato all'inizio, quindi insomma, ci racconterà lui a tempo e spazio per, per spiegarci il suo percorso e le sue idee, il suo punto di vista e che cosa lo interessa e lo incuriosisce in, in questo ambito. Ok, hello everybody, thank you for the introduction Marta. First I want to also apologize and thank you to, in fear of having a monologue and soliloquy, I also want to understand a bit from, for you guys what is interesting because otherwise people who know me know that I can rant and talk forever. So. To avoid that, maybe if you want to give me a little bit of direction of what you are really interested in for me to maybe give a, a starting point and then I can maybe go from there. Well, we, in, in this studio, we are going to work uh, uh, on a research uh, on body um, with the aim uh, of developing concepts that can nurture a drop uh, garment collection for each single student. So the brief we launch uh, is inspired by the Useless Bodies uh, exhibition that we're here at the Prada Foundation uh, by Ernest and Green. And, uh, um, but the students uh, are invited to find their own uh, uh, direction, their own interpretation of what uh, will uh, remain uh, about bodies in our contemporary society and then in particular in, in fashion. So we wanted to, to have you to, to talk about your personal research as a designer, but also as a human being, to inspire them, or uh, if not inspire them, to as an example of how a designer, but also a person, can work on such a concept personally, individually, and translate uh, even a, a stratified concepts into visual. Uh, elements. Uh, so uh, feel free to, to share anything you think is relevant about uh, your uh, stream of, of, of thoughts uh, sure. about the topic. Okay. Yeah, it's a very interesting process and, and, and again, it's, it's very fascinating to, to connect with you, Marta, and back to Italy because as uh, Marta has introduced, I i was in Milan many years ago uh, studying design, graphic design and art direction uh, at IED in Milan. But my reason and background is in a way totally very connected to, to the story of body and to, to the story of the image and, and fashion, but in a way from a totally different perspective. I was very interested as a child um, because I... My family was, we immigrated from Taiwan to Australia uh, when I was the age of seven. And because of this transition, I was always, it's kind of a curse and also a blessing that I was always looking at everything from the outside. 
as a foreigner, but also as somebody that uh, was not part of the the lexicon or the vocabulary of image. By that, I mean the vocabulary of the global north uh, of the hegemonic society, the 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 society and the image of the the mainstream society. And with that, the benefit of that is that I was never part of it, but always wanting in. But because I was never part of it, I was able to always see it a bit differently. So I, I when I was in Italy, I was a, there was a very nice education, and, and I really enjoyed my time in Italy and, and learned a lot about fashion. Uh, but it wasn't until I moved to New York that uh, and, and pursuing fashion photography uh, that I, I really was diving deeper into it. And, and New York is, in a way, perhaps not the capital of fashion, uh, but at least the capital of finance. And so that has very much to do with what I realized from a psychoanalytic perspective, my true driving force, which is uh, really about power. Power because I, I, I lacked so much power. That there was a, a kind of emptiness of it. In any case, I, I, when I was in New York and, and I studied uh, fashion photography, and uh, at that time, doing my master's, I met uh, Melita Baumeister, uh, a designer that was also studying design and uh, fashion in, in New York at the same time. And from her, I, I received uh, my next large uh, education with regards to fashion. Because up until that point, if you would remember that uh, as someone that came from uh, the backwaters, as also known as Australia... Uh, th there is not much of a culture or understanding regarding to fashion because we are seasonally opposite to the global north. Uh, we are geographically very distanced from the economic exchanges of power and, and fashion, which is located more for in, in Paris, one could say. And so I had no idea about fashion. And so for me, I was just uh, you know a young guy who... For fashion, for me, it's just an understanding of power, of sexuality. And I had no clue what, what, what else was going on except for beautiful people. And with Melita, it was very interesting because at first we, we decided to make a, a brand. From We were just young students with nothing. And, and we decided to, to start making a brand. And, and at the time, Melita was experimenting a lot with sculptural elements or with materiality. And she would create these wonderful pieces. And at the time, it was we, we, we were riding a wave, I would say, looking back, you know, especially this kind of minimalist Tumblr wave. Uh, you know, that was really the years of Tumblr. And I remember we, we had this one time when she was creating pieces and she would, I'm sure you guys are aware of this, but I, me not really coming from fashion, uh, looking, first we've got to get the materials. And she would get all these materials and was very experimental. And I was very confused. I was like, why are you buying all of these latex and, you know, synthetics? And for me, coming from Australia uh, and not, again, not from fashion, for me, the, the idea of synthetics was always like the idea of like, um, in, in my uneducated brain, was like uh, cheap cheap knockoffs or, you know, cheap products from Vietnam or cheap things. And, and here she was trying to, she's creating um, luxury, we're creating a luxury fashion brand. And, you know, she, she, she was in love with experimenting with very synthetic uh, uh, materials. She would do a lot of things like, um, I mean, sometimes we would use cotton, but it, w it would be bonded a million times over. So that structurally is something to work with. And she looked at me like I was a complete idiot. You know, she said, she don't understand anything. I was like, why can't we just get cotton or, you know, sustainable material or something comfortable? And, and it took many more years uh, later. I mean, there was, I photographed um, the late Albert Herbaz, the, the previous creative director of um, L'Enfant. And... He had something very interesting to say. He said, when you're designing clothes, what are we designing for? 
And at the time, this is before Tumblr, before the, the, the crazy world we have today. But already there was very interesting. But he said, am I designing for the body? Or am I designing for the runway? Or am I designing for the rack? And at my time, I thought, okay, well, are we designing for Instagram? Or are we designing for, for the lookbook? And all of these I realized as we were doing it and producing it was for totally different reasons. Because I'm coming in as a, as a man with not the experience in fashion, not interest even that much, uh, totally from the outside. And I thought, Christ, this is not very comfortable to wear. But it looks fantastic, you know, and, and photographically, it's amazing. And, and that was one of the reasons that attracted me to, to Melita's work was because I was also looking for something to photograph because a lot of the things that I would receive from the showroom was something that from an image perspective, I, I could not do something special or to, to stand out and, and this kind of thing. So maybe I can show you one of the first pictures and the first collections that... Okay, so now I go here to share the screen. Uh, so, yeah, for example, this, this is a, a coat that um, is made from neoprene. And I mean, now it's probably very common, and, but at the time it was not really, it was one of the first, in my understanding, we were the kind of the first people to, to be producing this kind of thing. Uh, which then later became a kind of trend. And, you know, not only was it neoprene, it's, I mean, the, the basis of it came from uh, biker jackets, but everything is oversized. And it was funny because at the time we were so poor, but Melita would buy, um, she would only buy T-shirts from Kmart, but this kind of uh, 4XL T-shirts for really big people. So everything was this oversized thing and... and and so this, this neoprene, I mean, first she did also cast op uh, kind of variations. Um, and for me, it was magnificent because, and was interesting because here, you know, there is a model, but you cannot really see who the person is. No, the, 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 the material completely takes over uh, not only the person, but here in this case, the, the image, you know, there's almost no space. I mean, could just be a... A mannequin or dead body underneath you don't know but it's almost more interesting than than the person is and what was interesting for me it, it took me many more years to kind of psychoanalyze myself and the psychology behind it because at the time this was when instagram was first starting to to come up and this is even in a way pre-influencer of course there was influencers before like celebrities but not in the sense that People were diving deep into this phase of history where it was like a hyper sharing of identity. And, you know, this is me, this is my breakfast, and this is my dog. For us, we were kind of going the opposite way. And there's a, there's a reason behind that. And it's kind of interesting, even if at the time we cannot admit it. So in, in a way, this everything we were doing, you could assign that this is a kind of fetishistic disavow in the sense that we could not really deal with ourselves. We were ashamed or cannot deal with that. And But everything goes into this world where we're creating, you could say minimalist, but in a way, it's a better way to describe it is a complete removal of self, a removal of personality. It's a total void. It's kind of beyond that. So this was the kind of uh, period and uh, experimentation where we took elements and just ex extracted everything. So that there is only the essence of it, and but that that would be too simplistic, you know, because you could also see that period there was also like a very big kind of minimalist trend. But actually, for me, I was not so interested in this concept. It was more about to remove everything, but then what is left is a kind of uh, intensity of uh, almost uh, violent proportions. For example, this is pieces that was made from Tyvek. It's actually a patent owned by the, the DuPont that is making the packaging for um, space suits, but also like um, postage because it's, you, cannot, you almost cannot tear it. Um, it's, it's a kind of paper, but inside there is also uh, with cotton, it's, it's very crunchy. And then here, you know, there's a kind of deliberate scrunching up 
This is almost like a package. This is the the kind of world. But in a way, the the experimentation kind of drew me to to some extremes of like you know where just to look at it, image wise, to to continue removal, removal, removal. But that that was those years, you know. That this was the kind of um, the period, and 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 everything we did was this kind of thing. And then there was also speaking back. To the reference from Albert and, and thinking about um, you know the body and and like who who and what are you designing for and who are you having a dialogue with? I mean, it was nice with these collections. For example, it started to take off when、uh, we had clients like Rihanna or the late、uh, Zaha Hadid or, or Lady Gaga, and it was great for them in that period, you know, because it's to to have something that people were kind of wanting that was. Taking a bit beyond than just the body, but this conversation and and about the body, where, like where was it going? And you know, the, the, we had also, I don't think I have the image here, but we made it. A, we made a coat.、It、was interesting because the print of the coat was the print of the tumbler itself. Actually, let me see if I could find this jacket. So we put the images of the coat from、um, the pictures that were very popular on the internet, and then reimposed it back onto the clothing itself. So there's a kind of repetition in terms of what are you watching? Because then, where is the what is the interest and what is the content? Eventually, for me, this kind of got. I mean, me and Melita, we we ended up having a separation、uh, in terms of understanding and interest. And for me, this this is kind of reflective, also in terms of coming back full circle about regarding this conversation about bodies. It's interesting because then, for example, you know, with the lockdown, this is a very interesting period for me because then to look at still the idea of fashion when. We are all just sitting at home, and I was really fascinated by what was going on and happening online, as these things usually tend to to stay. Because I mean, we're making these clothes, and it's it's great that、um, you know people. Yeah, this was this was the actually here's the here's the black version of the coat. This is another designer's、uh, scarf, actually, but this is one of the first periods of this, but. For me, there was something a bit disturbing about this, where you remove the human element, which is kind of where we're all moving towards. And as capitalism increases in speed, and we keep removing, removing, removing. I don't know if you guys watch、uh, any streams, like、uh, I don't know if you know this one, called called Nico. So this is a streamer, and So here is—I don't know if you can see the picture if it's too small—but it's a. It's, she's a streamer on Twitch, but what's fascinating is that her avatar, or it's not even avatar; it's it's really herself. But she wears a,、uh, a kind of a body suit. It's this thing, and back I think it's cheaper now. But back then, it's like fifty thousand dollars for this suit. That is a constant scan, and she she appears live stream like I am doing now, but. She has always this、um, skin, and and face, and avatar. And people, if they pay, you can write a message that goes across her chest. And、uh, and so this was really fascinating because it's not like one or two people watching this. It's it's you know she has a fifty thousand dollar suit, and she can create in some you know she can be in all kinds of characters, not just this.、Uh, Online version of her. I mean, at the same time with Melita, there was like somebody designed for、um, Melita. You know this game, The Sims. So this is a skin that you can buy for this game, The Sims, or not? Yes, I think it's for Sims, where you can buy the skin of Lady Gaga and、uh, one of the dresses of Melita for for the video game. And This is completely fascinating because I mean back then it's like you know much lower quality and so on. But I mean, for example, now one of the biggest video games is this game Fortnite, and 
I was completely blown away by just. It's a game that is free, but people spend all their money on the fashion of the game, and even in this game, it's really fascinating that most of the、uh, clothing and skins or personality or characters are female characters and female clothing. Even though probably I think there's more male men playing this video game, and so it, it, I don't know. It just completely blows my mind. So that that's a little bit of the direction, but for me, the other part that was really feeling very weird and、um, alienating for me was because also doing this brand, for me as a Asian man, working in this brand, and everything was、uh, the the resemblance of a kind of woman. And I realized after all these years that deep down, the great desire was actually to. I mean, th- there's the saying in psychoanalysis that it's sometimes when you are in a relationship with somebody, it's not so much that you want to、uh, be with this person. Sometimes it's actually that you want to actually be the other person. Well, it depends on how far you take it and, and personal choices of if、uh, question of transgenderism. If you actually want to be, but sometimes I think it's really a matter of, of more of a psychological interest and fascination. But at the same time, I realized how, because of that desire, how completely out of the picture I was in this whole landscape that I was、uh, functioning in. And so, for me, a big departure from all of this was when I witnessed、uh, during lockdown and my own personal experience with COVID and everything was the、um, total disappearance of, for me as an Asian person, no, so. You know, with COVID and with Trump saying China flu, blah 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 blah, the violence towards Asian exploded like crazy, and this is something that people still have a difficult time believing. When I tell, yes, me too. When I walk down the street, I mean, now I live in Berlin, but people look at me like a disease. You know, either completely、uh, with animosity, hatred, or people start to say really crazy things, and so I start to to really go and and study. Into this more because it was affecting me personally, and so I realized with the kind of responsibility for myself and the world that I was functioning in, that it's kind of part of the whole system, where not only myself but any kind of variations that is linked to me is completely invisible, and so you know it's easy when we think about racism or colonialization. That yes,、uh, you know,、uh, it's terrible、uh, of the colonizers、uh, and and you know like King Leopold from Belgium and 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 you know Queen Elizabeth the colonizers that go and destroy and ah it's terrible we should get rid of them but it, it's not so simple it's not so easy I think we are all in a way complicit in the design of this ideology of what is、uh, the image and what is considered valid. Or real, and what is considered not real and not valid, and what does that say when we create things and we remove things like body and humanities? And so, if you allow me to discuss, think a little bit about like the origins of humanism and and all these things, you know, it's it's very fascinating because, in a way, you can also see that the reason that humanism started to have a real、um, incentive by capital is because. Let's suppose a country、uh, that has people who are not taken care of, who are not educated, who are not having rights, is a collective that cannot produce you a good factory to make cars, to make fashion, to make things, and is not a collective that can produce good military that can protect yourself. But it's fascinating at this point in junction in history where we have. The technology that is soon surpassing, as you probably have seen, like you know, this company、uh, Boston Dynamics. They have very fascinating work in terms of like robots. I mean, they have the robot like this, and then they have the dogs. No, I mean they have both, but it's it's very scary things because with this kind of thing, and and you know, you also probably hear about the factories that are producing things. That is,、uh, in a way, almost humanless. You know, they don't even have lights because it's just producing things out. 
So the question comes, how quick before we don't really need humans? We're not interested. You know, we can all sit at home and, and put on this body suits and then you just go and create uh, avatars. And, and of course, then you can think about that. But uh, we, are, we are moving in this direction. And so when I left New York, speaking of bodies, I mean, in a way, I was also getting to this point where um, I started to do work for um, Apple. I was making a, a lot of the campaigns like uh, for the watch and airport. Uh, so we were making uh, like this series, um, you know, where it's, it's very fascinating because it's, it's this kind of rhetoric where we say uh, everybody's the same, but actually, you know, it, it works very good for uh, neoliberal ideas uh, and, and advertising. But in the end, the product is more important than the, than the individual. And we are here to, to serve the product in a way. Uh, but for me, in the back of my head, it was starting to, to really stress me out in terms of where do I fit in all of this? Because you can get a very strong sense that if I'm not participating, if I'm not producing these kind of things for the market, for capital, uh, where do I stand? What is, the, what is the relevance of the body? And it goes back to the initial things that uh, we were designing, this idea like, okay, for, forget the body. We were not interested. We were not living in, in the body at all. We're just looking purely at the clothes. And that's when I left New York and I started to uh, research more into bodies. And this is where it led me to sexuality, to, to BDSM. You know, when I was in my 20s in New York, when I saw people who were interested in BDSM, I thought, oh, this is some perverted things that, that people, uh, really sick things or whatever, you know. Uh, but it was not until I, I came to, to research this, and fascinating enough, it was kind of through doing all of this, through fashion, doing advertising, that actually the reason I started to, to really look into this was because I was working uh, for Apple and we were making... Um, for the watch, and I was uh, photographing, um, you know, this Olympian Simone Biles. She's, she's like the, the world's uh, most, she, she has the most gold medals in history, I think. And she's this gymnast, and I was photographing the world's best gymnast because we were producing these uh, advertising where people are floating in the air. And I was doing this for like months. And because I was watching all these bodies flying through the air, doing crazy acrobatics, I thought, wow, of course I can also do that because I'm telling them to do that. So I started to also research more into gym, gym, gymnasium, gymnastics. Uh, but what I didn't realize was that in my head, I understood what they were doing, but my body, you know, I am not an athlete in that sense. So I went to, to learn gymnastics and I nearly uh, broke my back on the first day. With that, I started to, to research more and, and really to understand the body. What, what is it capable of doing? And I kind of went uh, the other direction to, to return to the body, to, to really be more curious. And I realized I was so dissociated from, from, from the flesh. And this comes back to why the reason I started to talk about the fact that it's important to think about that I was born in Taiwan with ancestors from Japan, going to Australia, but all, all the while kind of unable to see myself because I was not seeing myself in the uh, colonial conception of the world. And when I realized this, first I was very depressed for, for many years because I couldn't face this idea. And, you know, again, back to the idea of a fetishistic disavow, in a way my entire interest in fashion, in all of these things, was because I could not deal with myself. I could not face myself. I could not see myself in the mirror. In fact, when I, the a funny side story was that we were getting quite uh, more attention and New York Times wanted a portrait of Melita. And so I was going to take a portrait of Melita and, and we nearly had a, I mean, we, we start to fight all the time, but it was impossible to take a portrait of Melita because we both had such strong self-hate. She cannot see herself like many people working in fashion. And what's fascinating for me, the research is that many people that were doing and interested what I was doing and doing similar things, what I was doing, 
I noticed that none of them could have their face on Instagram or have their pictures taken. This, so that's when I start to, to dig into uh, psychoanalysis and, and psychology. In any case, back to the bodies, uh, along the research, uh, I started to, in Berlin, I started to research heavily uh, into, first was always about gymnastics, because I wanted to understand from the perspective of people who deal with their bodies their entire life uh, and to learn from them, to know how, how this functions. But from, yeah, this was, for example, one campaign that I did for, yeah, it's this dancer and he's kind of jumping uh, through the whole city because, yeah, he's through the, I don't know, escapism of the AirPods and, and listening to music and so on. But I didn't, I, I was kind of bored with just dealing with the superficial, you know? So first I was bored with just, okay, we remove the body, don't think about the body, but at some point it's like, so what the fuck am I designing for? You know, I'm not so interested to design just skins for uh, simulation. I mean, could be for, for some people. But I was really curious about what the body is needing and wanting and saying. And so I worked with the gymnast. And then with the gymnast, I discovered uh, these practitioners within the, the field of BDSM. And what is BDSM? You know, bondage, uh, sadomasochism. Uh, with this field, I discovered a very interesting group of people. And they, they were making conferences and they involved uh, philosophers, uh, psychologists, uh, doctors, Olympians, swimmers, uh, martial artists. And what I discovered that they were doing were uh, combining a lot of these different disciplinarians of thoughts and experimentations around the body and pushing it to the limits. Uh, and this was organized by a good friend of mine, Felix Ruckert. He's a, a, also a choreographer that... Uh, came from the school also with Pina Bausch, I'm, I'm sure you know some, uh, and, and in this field. But he started to discover also sexuality and BDSM and how that is functioning with the body. So also, I'm not sure if you know, like the, the research study or the field of buto, the Japanese um, dance expression. And, and so that has been the kind of area that I was going into because I realized, here's the other thing too about fashion, uh, and going back to the original discussion I was saying about power, is that uh, with fashion, even with what we're doing, so during this Tumblr world, you know, probably you've seen like these Instagram posts, it's like people who are into minimalists, you know, hashtag minimalism. But this is not at all what we were interested in. It's not about minimalism. We were not about just removal. I mean, sure, then you can do that and you can make very easy, boring pictures like this and sell AirPods and, and boring technology pieces. But actually what, uh, you know, th there was one thing that I did was very interesting because uh, for both Melita and I, uh, at the time, we were not leaving the house, really. I mean, we were already living in lockdown and not really participating in, we were, you know, socializing or getting laid. But uh, actually, it's not here. It was more of a campaign that we did. Anyway, there, there were these elements... Um, Ah, here, for example, this is not the campaign, but just, you know, BDSM elements. And it was very difficult for me to understand, like also uh, remember the seasons from that uh, Balenciaga, also taking a lot from BDSM elements. And what I found interesting was I was, I spoke to another fashion design student and she's very er young and uh, interested in the work that I was doing, but what I was confused about was like, what is this passion and interest in latex, in sexuality, in, you know, there's a kind of violence that even if a person did not go and study and do all these things, there is, where is this coming from? For me, that was a, even when we, what seems to be a nice, polite picture like this, for me, in us, there was this very strong tendency or desire, uh, kind of um, a libidinal drive that was not really understood or expressed, but can come through fashion and um, can, can completely live it. And, and so this is really fascinating. And for me, till this day, fashion 
is a, still a very interesting space in which you can see the some kind of underlying things to express. And, and what's more fascinating is supposedly we are, you know, in 2022, whatever that means, but we are even not in the 19th century where we are trying to say God is dead and we are no longer under the 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 you know authority of the church uh, of 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 uh, the pope and so on and all of the rules and we have to subliminate through fashion or express but actually I, I would say that is not so easy to say and it's, even if we are su supposedly more secular in today's world yet I think um, I mean what is it's not so fun where everything is permitted and this is the next fascinating thing that I was noticing through the exploration of sexuality, especially here in Berlin, but now as sexuality becomes more commodified. I mean, we are 2022 post OnlyFans, no? We, we push every possible avenue to the extreme. And then the question is, so in a, uh, in a field like fashion, where it lives on trend and the unexplored, where will you take that? Where are you going to... to go with in a world where everything is permissible, I think is then the thing that is not really expressed. So this is a little bit of an introduction of the madness of what I've been thinking about. Yeah, so maybe if, if anybody have any questions before I lose myself again in, in total uh, random thoughts. Here's a question. You mentioned uh, COVID before. And uh, I know uh, it's not really related uh, to what you said, uh, but um, I was thinking, how do you think uh, COVID has changed the way we take up the space in this world? Like, um, how it did, uh, has changed uh, the way we relate to other people, to other things, uh, like in fashion? The way we take up space, how um, affects uh, fashion? Because we know COVID uh, changed uh, the way we take, up, we take up space. We don't want people really close to us. But how did this change the uh, fashion? It's a, it's, a, it's a very fascinating time. And uh, I would say we are still living through that, still ongoing. I mean, COVID is uh, endemic at this point. It's, it's not gone away. But I think what raises a large discussion is these different choices that each person makes. No, there, there are, of course, one can think immediately of like the COVID deniers. I mean, first of all, the, the, the real big problem is the question of how our brain can or is having difficulty to function in a global society. So, for example, the mask, right now, like the COVID mask. I mean, me being Asian and in Asia, there has been other pandemics but even pandemic aside, like if you've ever been to Tokyo, into Japan, Tokyo being for, for a very long time, a very highly concentrated area. Uh, and, and also with the culture, it is um, very common for a very long time that people would wear masks just for cold. And they understood this. And so in Japan, you wear a mask not because you are afraid of the other, but rather it's through the respect that you are ashamed that you're going to uh, make other people sick. So it's fascinating then with the individualism of the West that, uh, especially like you can see some p people in Germany, that people are defiant on wearing the mask because of their need for individuality and expression. But I mean, even before COVID was kind of interesting because, uh, for example, there's this funny picture. This is also, you know, quite a fantastic uh, <laughs> fetish or you know I, I also started to take up diving because of my work and um, this is funny because for diving uh, I was not so first I had to dive I had to get my diving instru uh, license uh, to work so I never I, I had never the fantasy to to go and look at the fish I, I thought this was very a strange underwater tourism that I was not so in, in, interested in but I was interested in in uh, the clothing the fashion uh, and, and the, the act of it and I, I went to dive uh, also in Iceland. I want to dive in really cold places because then you can wear, it's like a spacesuit. I like diving at night because you have uh, these crazy apparatus. And, and this is also in a way to completely this experience of separating the body 
from the world. It's a it's a very I, I would say post maybe post Kantian post uh, like Western thought of the idea that you are separate from the universe, which for the Hindus or the Buddhists this is not the case. This is an an illusion, a a concept that that is a bit alienated. And and if you want to go down the the, the path of Marx, I mean you know. Just look at this picture, like, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, rich uh, Karens and and, uh, and and what is the male Karen in America? Whatever, the, the rich uh, kind of people. And, you know, you are completely separated from the world, you know, which is then ironic because then you look at some of these enclaves like Gwyneth Paltrow, the goop. No, then it's all about trying to desperately regain community. And, and this is... What is so fascinating, because in, in these community, in these new phases, like, for example, uh, now they just finished Burning Man. And there is also fascinating because who are the people going to Burning Man? It's like a very it, r now is a kind of rich elite group of people trying to rediscover the body, the you know environment. But at the same time, I mean, Burning Man is also a fetishistic disavow from uh, the fact that uh, we are destroying the world and so on and so on. And, and, and so you get together and uh, try to, to reintegrate. So, yeah, this is a, a very fascinating time. And I think, I mean, I, I got COVID twice. And so it's uh, during this time, this, it, for me, was the closest thing was like a very intense psychedelic trip. But you are no longer thinking, for me, was not so thinking straight. And the fear can take over oneself. And so it's interesting to see how fashion, and it depends on the individual and how you do it. Anyway, whatever you do, there's a kind of way that shows your relationship to these philosophies. I mean, this is not really related, but I just love this picture, for example. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, how do you relate to your environment? And COVID, I think, is just an interesting symptom I mean, the diseases are always going to be around and will be around. But what is the, you know, how do you fit into, uh, this is a random, I was trying to find another picture. This is not the right picture. Yeah, I, I don't know if I answered the question at all, but uh, maybe we'll leave it at that. Ah, here, here's the picture. Here's, I love this one. Do you know about click farms? And we talk about social media, we talk about the internet uh, and all these things. And this is, you know, there are these places where people just have, you know, you can buy clicks. In a way, we are already living very deep in the matrix. And so when you said about uh, how, how it affects fashion and, and all these things, and everything is kind of just for the, the understanding of the surface. But, I mean, you can disconnect from that, and that will live on its own, you know? The, the computers will talk to each other, and the, we are generating all of these imagined world that continues to go on. I mean, one of the things that uh, has been fascinating me, of course, is like this, uh, the world of AI. And, you know, it, this is in a way like psychoanalysis uh, with, uh, the, with artificial intelligence to, to put in the, some of the ideas that you are thinking about and seeing it, how it re-manifests itself and reimagined. I suspect that this is also just some symptoms of fear of the other. And then it's very much remaining in the, in, in the imaginary world. It was really fascinating to also meet and see people were creating these kind of things and then to discover the human behind it and to see how completely not bodily they are. And being in the kink scene, it's very interesting to see the difference, you know, the, for example, again, like when Melita and I were working in New York, we, we were very much, much focused on the work itself. And, you know, we were living in lockdown for many years and we never designed, we never uh, thought about our own experience, really. So this is kind of interesting. So I'm very curious for, I mean, for me, I had memories before COVID and living a, a, a life before. So I'm not sure. And I'm curious for, for you guys, how, where you would take it in terms of how you relate to yourself and, and to the items in which you are creating, do you use it? Uh, actually, going back to, to this, the thing I was showing you before, the, the BDSM thing, a very funny story. I was at a dungeon party once, 
And, you know, people are doing kinky things, but actually I would say that people were not doing so much kinky things. The most kinky thing itself was to wear the clothes and to be seen there. They were not doing much sexually explicit things. And one of the most quote-unquote perverted things I saw was a man who was dressed completely in this kind of diving suit, but he was alone. He was inside a dungeon and just getting very aroused and excited by himself in the dungeon, but in public, but alone. So he was completely enjoying the desire of the desire with nobody. But this was pre-COVID. But he was already totally enjoying. And so, but the, this kind of alienation, I mean, in Korea, you know, they have these um, dating bars that you go and because everybody's single and quite depressed and alone and they go to the bar and they have this one thing and you eat alone and then suddenly they open the, the, the wall and there's another person there and they kind of force you to interact a bit, you know. And in Japan, because they are running out of young people, so the government is pushing for free alcohol and pushing to, for dating and for sexuality because they are afraid, you know, to not able to maintain the economy. And so it's, it's like, uh, what, what is the quote? Um, the two most terrible things to happen in your life is to not get what you want and to get what you want. And in a way with COVID and with all these things, I, I, I might even suggest from a psychoanalytical perspective that we are really achieving our greatest disappointment. Ariotto, yeah. you mentioned uh, the concept of permission. So in, in some way, there's uh, uh, an implicit uh, request for permission in a fashion photography, in a fashion image, uh, permitting uh, uh, in, in some way a relationship between uh, the image itself and the, the, the viewer. So how do you see or how do you feel your your perspective on, on fashion into your your work has changed uh, with, with the aim you have to, if I understand correctly, uh, with, with the aim of uh, deleting the violence that you were seeing uh, in certain images? I'm not sure if I understand completely your question. Um. So I'm asking uh, as you were commenting uh, that certain images on, on body and certain fashion items were communicating to you and, and were, were full of uh, uh, desire and violence in, in expressing uh -huh. this, this desire for body and this desire for sexuality. How in your work uh, you have been uh, trying to delete this, this uh, content, this violent content, and how at the end there's still a relationship which is permitting uh, the, the, the viewer of the image itself in entering and understanding uh, the concept you want to pass through right. your, your fashion image. Um, I, I would say that at first uh, my attempt was an attempt of clarification and not the removal of violence. It's through the reductionism that I wanted to reach this inner inertia, so-called violence, so-called libidinal drive. It was to unearth that. On one hand, it's not that somebody's stopping me. In, in a way, there is censorship and increasing. But in another, it was more that I was not ready for it myself to admit to myself that I have those desires. But for example, I was making um, this series, looking at bodies and, and looking at sexuality was interesting because later there's a company, my friend started a company called Field. It's a kind of like sexual dating app. Uh, and, and they really love this, this series. Uh, but this is also in a way kind of an example of that where I wanted to be anonymous and in a way, in this world, you know, it's it's almost like going to Berkheim, going to a dark dark room, and you don't care about the individuality of the person or the shame that comes with it. It's just pure body, pure uh, drive, pure anim animalistic uh, sexuality, uh, the, the thing. But I wanted to, in a way, not upset my parents. <laughs> In a way, you know, I'm not saying my real parents, but in a way, like the, the shame that I cannot handle and, and to package it nicely. But for me, I was never interested into 
uh, removal of violence. It's actually a deep passion uh, and interest in that. But how do I mitigate that with myself? Uh, that, that is the question. I mean, the experience of colonialism for everybody is, uh, and well, history itself is an experience of violence. I mean, life is violence. But I think part of the intensifying process is simultaneously, especially in the neoliberal world, where the, the idea to reduce uh, complexity, reduce problems so that transactions can be easier globally. So if somebody is upsetting me, then we might not do business and that's not good for the economy. But if everybody is not so upsetting and not offensive, and, and we can just move the capital around, there's almost like a desire of capital and, and, to, to, and ideas to move around with less complications. But I come to realize uh, the nonsense of this idea, because uh, this is what, in my opinion, also tends to lead to a new kind of uh, fascism, which we're kind of witnessing in today's world, um, aside from, from ignorance, but I think also just from the inability to handle what is behind that. What is the, the yeah, I mean, if we were back to Freudian or Jungian thing about the unconscious the things that we cannot integrate. I mean, you know, I was making, I thought it was like nice, pretty pictures and that's, that's lovely and all, you know, but for me, a big part was like trying to understand how to take even my dreams and my nightmares, but in a way to, to put it through, through the work. Um, and this is kind of like my conscious brain is saying, okay, do this and this, and it's very nice and it looks good. Uh, maybe even get some jobs, but uh, deep down there's a, there's a, a different world, you know, the dream world and, and the kind of unconscious uh, driving force uh, that is functioning behind all of this. So this is my ongoing research. I mean, even for uh, this kind of things, it's, um, yeah, take what you will from this. I'll move uh, the mic around because there are some questions. Yes. Ah, I found this. Uh, this is the thing I was talking about. I quite like this little yeah. thing. You touched it on uh, AI before uh, a few moments ago. So I just wanted to ask you a question about that. Um, so with the recent development of uh, AI is having uh, uh, in, a sort, in a sort of uh, in a sort of uh, like creative role um, what do you think that uh, the role of AI could be in uh, the near future uh, um, around what uh, uh, creative work like photography or fashion design? Um, because, uh, I don't know, like, are you scared? Because I am a little bit uh, seeing like the similarities of how AI works uh, uh, compared to like even what we're learning right now. So like uh, about uh, image research and then creating based on the, um, the images you found, but AI obviously has a much more uh, of a, we can say, calculating power, so it's like this concept, but uh, um, I don't know, like uh, I'm probably uh, getting out of topic, but uh, uh, I just wanted to know what you think about the future of AI in creative work. Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely, you should be terrified. And I think we are not terrified enough. But at the same time, you know, comes back to my original thesis is that uh, fear, uh, unfortunately, gets you nowhere. So I think it's important to dive yourself. I mean, then, you know, I want to be careful to not go too deep into accelerationism. But yeah, I mean, this is interesting because... Um, I, I have also, it, it's, it's kind of the new Oracle, no? Like uh, before you might go to the Oracle or Delphi and, you know, talk to the gods and so on. But now, you know, I can, you can literally talk, you know, I, I have conversations with the AI. You ask it questions and it's not to say that um, the AI necessarily is an individual, but rather it's a kind of collective, I mean, it's a manifestation of the collective unconscious. Uh, and so it takes everything and then calculates more. And 
you know, it's, it doesn't take much intelligence of ourselves to realize that, well, what, what is my role in this picture? I mean, just on a very uh, techno, technological level discussion, the fun part is, and from a, a kind of capitalistic perspective of like, okay, that's great because, for example, like in, in design, they are making these, and from an engineering perspective, no, like they, they have come to really beautiful calculations. Like, let's say you are making a car, like a Formula One car, uh, and before you need all these parts, but you tell the AI what you want, what you need, and you want to reduce the material. So you reduce your cost. And it tells you without reducing the tension and uh, engineering needs, it creates something that looks almost more organic and in a way that uh, our systematic machine-minded brain in a very humanistic sense can never arrive to. So the optimistic side is say, ah, oh, yes, yes, we work in conjunction with the machine, right? So then it's like, even for me, it's like, okay, so, you know, I had some, some thoughts and, and, you know, uh, you know, you, you take in like, uh, different ingredients of what you like and the machine helps you to give you like, for example, you know, this brand Salomon shoes. So I was making like Salomon shoes, uh, mixed with, I, I forgot what this is, you know, mixed with different things. And, and then you, you, you arrive into, you know, I mixed it with like uh, MotoGP or some, you know, <laughs> different materials. And it, it, it gives you, you know, and sometimes, you know, it's like, what the hell is this? And, but slowly you, you can work with that. And that's the optimistic part. But the, the next question is, who owns the algorithm? And do you have the benefit, the, 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 the rights to twinkle with the AI and already I'm kind of banned like, like me on Instagram, I'm banned also on some of these AI because I keep looking for the edge. And this is a real fascinating question about fashion because on the one hand, uh, in the kind of global idea, sure. We want to, I forget which philosopher is like, okay, don't cause harm to hurt others. No. Okay. That's great. You don't want to hurt other people uh, because we want to have a functional society. But first of what is hurt, what is harm? You know, that, that definition is very difficult to, to think about. And when we are here talking about fashion, a lot about fashion is something provocative. I mean, if you're not provocative, it, I'm sorry, it's just decoration. And so are you making just decorative things? You know, what are we doing as fashion? Are we simply producing... And I would argue we are far beyond that. It's not just you are cold, so you get a coat. No, you are not producing something comfortable, something to protect you from the elements. We're producing signs. You're producing emotions. You're producing a provocation. You're touching on fear. You're touching on excitement. No. So if you give an example in food, then it's like, yeah, okay, McDonald's tastes great, you know, as my eight-year-old taste buds would say, but... I'm sorry, do you want to eat McDonald's for the rest of your life? You want to go and taste something weird at some point. You want to taste something sublime, something strange. And same can be said about fashion. You know, you want to find the edge. But then going back to the idea of this kind of global police of, you know, uh, 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 Silicon Valley technocratic feudalism, where we give the power to very selective companies, not even a government anymore, because the companies own the government, and they decide what is considered okay and not, right? And so you say, okay, sure, on Instagram, we want to protect our children from pedophiles, so no sexuality. But I'm sorry, but the, the whole thing, everything is about sex, as uh, Oscar Wilde said, no, except for sex, which is about power. So on the, on, on the discussion of fashion, which is so much about you know, the expression of God knows what, uh, but we have a kind of limit. And so suddenly we have people that is, uh, it's like, uh, let's say the idea of, of God, right? So is God really truly the one in charge or is it the technocrats such as the priests who have before the control of the printing press and language itself that then shapes your relationship with God and reality itself? And so now we have the new popes and the new 
uh, priest of our current reality, which is the AI of a kind of sentient consciousness, collective con unconsciousness. But there are very specific people that tells us what is okay and what is not okay. So if we avoid it, which is, you know, I mean, con you know, good luck to move to the forest and live by yourself. Or the, I think the other way is to, to truly understand it, also to understand AI. Uh, but it's, it's, I think it's going to be a very wild reality. Actually, we are already living in this weird reality because for me, uh, when I created these, this is only, a, you know, uh, actually, this, I like this one very much. Um, but, you know, I've already been banned. A bit, and a lot of these words that I was putting in are no longer uh, allowed and they, they are giving me so much warnings. And same as Instagram, they, they banned me and, uh, you know, they, they, I, I lost many followers and they reduce everything and, you know, they push for, and then, so if you look on the internet and all these things nowadays, it's a very strange reality with things more and more going to the marginal. And so, uh, back to, to fashion, I think it's, it's a very interesting way to see how does the, the, the people on the outside, on the edge, the fringe of society will express themselves? Uh, Yoto, I have another question for you. Hi. I have a, a personal question. So if you decide to not answer that one, it will be okay. Um, can I ask you why you changed your name? Um, I've always been uh, curious to know if uh, it was uh, a direct consequence of a special growth uh, or something else. Yes, yes, this is a common thing and I think it's, it's a fascinating one. It's also fascinating that uh, you were anticipating that I might and have the option to not answer. Um, no, it's, it's a very interesting question. Uh, first off, th there's many foundations of it. I mean, when I was, uh, when I was young, I, I was... Uh, I had two big influence. Like I was going to the school, uh, it's actually a German Lutheran school in Australia, but on the weekends I would go to a Buddhist school to learn uh, about my culture and uh, my religion. When I was born, I was given one set of name. It was actually given to my grandfather. He went to a fortune teller and the fortune teller gave the name. And the name is in Taiwanese is the But Taiwan is... Uh, what is Taiwan? Taiwan is a series. I mean, my ancestor, my, my great, 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 great grandfather was a samurai who was coming from China and he's a Ming loyalist. What does that mean? He's, uh, China was not just China. There's different regions, but they escaped that region and they went to Japan and he became, he was a samurai and there was a, they were a warlord. And at the time they were invaded by the Qing dynasty. And so they wanted to reinvade back to China and take it back, but they failed. This is the story of my family. We're always failing. And so they, in, they, they escaped to this island now called Taiwan. Back then it was called Formosa. At the time it was the, it was a colony of the Dutch. The Dutch had colonized this island and for their trade. And they came and kicked them out. Then we stayed there for many hundred years. And this is my family line. Anyway, so then I got received this name. And then this name, because then we were colonized in the 90s, sorry, sorry, in the mid 20th century by the, com, uh, sorry, the nationalists from China. This is a new group of people. And they spoke a different language. And so we had to translate this name, De Po Yong, to Zheng Bo Rong. And this name is, again, you know, my grandmother, for example, speaks Japanese and Taiwanese. She does not speak Mandarin. And that's in the space of just three. Gener uh, sorry, what, how do you calculate this? Three generations from my grandparents to my generation. Then when I was seven, we moved, uh, immigrated to Australia because of the war with China and political reasons. And there, when you immigrate, they suggest you, you No, know, then this is the kind of invisible violence. They suggest you that it would be more convenient to take on an English name because then the white people will be more comfortable because they cannot say and pronounce your ethnic name. And so I chose, we chose the name Paul because actually the Chinese translation for Paul was Paolo, which is closer to the Italian name Paolo, which sounded closer, closest to Borong. And so that was the name that I had for those years, but it never made me comfortable, actually. It was always feeling not correct. And then the other influence was that in Australia, 
the indigenous Aborigines, uh, I learned from them that in their culture, you were given a name when you were born by your parents. Then when you are coming of age, and when you start to understand what it is in your life that you are doing, you decide on a new name as a uh, process of maturation and coming into adulthood. You choose a name based on what it is that is your life purpose for yourself. Then that's the transition. And then the third influence is that, again, back to the Buddhism, that my the people that were the kind of local uh, people in my world that were the kind of uh, leaders were Buddhist monks. And they are not gendered. They are not... It's not even about transgenderism. It's like they are just monks. They have a different pronoun. They have their own names. Like, And I remember a family friend of mine, and, you know, she was one woman, you know. And, and one day they say, ah, say hello to a monk so-and-so, like gentle clouds. <laughs> you know, of course, it's not that in English. It's a Chinese uh, Buddhist monk name, and you have to bow down to them. And I thought, wait, isn't that just so-and-so that, you know, last month, and now she, this person is not a person or, the, you know. Is, and so that was kind of what I was used to. And so in a way, in the back of my head, this was always the process, you know. I never I'm, I never related myself to Paul. And what's interesting was before the, the passport name I had in Australia, and m many of the Asians have many names. And in Australia, the first iteration was Paul P.J. Cheng. And I felt at the time that, and it was kind of the case, who knows if it's, how, you know, but, but the feeling is also important, that, you know, in Australia, it was very difficult for me to get a job. It was very difficult for me to integrate, and even if I was kind of, but, you know, if you look at the t statistics, it's not good. And I changed my name. I removed the word Cheng, and it's now, it was then Pao Jung. And it's funny, when I came to Germany, they loved it. The, the, the Germans that, the, you know, this is the unconscious racism. They would say, oh, Pao Jung, that's a great name. It sounds so German. And this is what Melita also loved. She said, ah, oh, your name could be German, you know, but I mean, who cares? And it was interesting that when I made this act and then when I changed it, I had many friends, very close friends, close white friends. Uh, they were very upset, you know, and they stopped being my friends. And this was also very interesting, this fear, because I would suspect that it's a reminder, uh, kind of an understanding of colonialism, that uh, the shame behind it and the, the, the fear to confront what is the past. But I would suggest that actually the the ability to confront the past and to look at it is the driving force for something very exciting and much more interesting as opposed to running away from things forever. Thank you. You're welcome. I have another, it's um, more than a question, it's like a, a suggestion on, on your stream of thoughts uh, about uh, um, this idea of uh, uh, desire, the desire of the desire. And uh, I was wondering if you ever thought of it uh, from a different age perspective. Um, I mean, because uh, while I'm listening to you, I have the feeling that you're always talking about adult life, okay? But um, so the way that adult society, like, if the society belongs to adults and just to them. But I, I was thinking, in it, I was wondering if you ever thought about the, the point of view of, uh, of the youngest of the kids or the, or, or the oldest or different, uh, different way of looking at the world and different uh, uh, um, type of experience that they might have. This is a very fascinating question because... For me, I think, on the one hand, this is very fascinating. When I was like uh, four or five, my father uh, would beat me. No, there was, this was a very common practice for that period, uh, a lot of violence. But I was beaten before I had memories also. But the first memory of understanding it was, he was my father was very upset at the fact that I was a child. He would tell me, when I was like four or five and, and he's beating me and he says, stop being like a child, which is fascinating because, you know, I mean, I was a child. No? 
Uh, but it got in my head that I remember, I have a very clear memory of looking myself in the mirror and I thought, God, why? And I internalized this, you know, God, I wish I was no longer a child. And this fear, what's very fascinating uh, as I reflect on myself, in, even in my adult life, is that my secret, also when I'm intimate with somebody, uh, actually I'm very uh, juvenile, I'm very childish actually, and I have a great desire for just childish things. And I speak like a child as well. It can be, you know, very playful. But on the other hand, this is a kind of compensation, you see, like at the same time, consciously or unconsciously, I'm trying so hard to be more adult-like, but at the same time, it's a compensation because, uh, yeah, this kind of dualism. And then the other thought is about how um, the, the idea of the, the invention, the invention of childhood, no, and this is also a large theoretical discussion. The, you know, the, the idea of childhood is, is very new. And one could say it's also very much rooted in capitalism. Like uh, there's a picture, if I can find it, like child coal miner. Uh, I mean, you know, my, my parents and my grandparents, they, they did not have the ch Western childhood. I mean, you know, even, even for the Western world, I don't know if you can see it. This is a, this is a six-year-old miner, not a child. He works in the coal mine. He's, he's, he, he's smoking a pipe. Like, you know, what the hell? This is, uh, this is the turn of the 20th century. You know, it's not so long ago. And so it, what's interesting, I mean, this is all children. So what is interesting is to think about the reason why. I mean, today, let's say in advertising, we are very much interested in the colonial, colonializing childhood. And there's a really interesting thing about, uh, if you will notice, like in, in particularly more in American uh, British societies, this fear of pedophilia. No? Like what's interesting, because in France, <laughs> those perverted French people, they are very obsessed with, you know, the Lolita concept and this kind of age dynamic. But for America... Uh, and, and, and Britain as well, but English-speaking countries, there, there is a great fear and the great need to protect the children. And if you think about, like, also advertising, no? like Mercedes, for example, they, have, they speak about this commonly, and it started with Ogilvy, and, you know, the, the importance to advertise early, right? A five-year-old is not able to drive a car, but you start selling them the idea, the image of the car. So they sell toys, they sell things. You know, I think they even have tools for little boys for yeah, doing hardware things like, you know, drills and all these things, but toys, but with a logo on it. So that when you are old, you can go and buy that. So the question comes back to who are you? Are you just another slave? Are you just another piano key, as Dostoevsky would say, of the larger thing? And I think this comes back to this, this, the invention of the innocence of childhood. And what's more fascinating is uh, another friend of mine said, like also here in Germany, I'm not sure how it is in Italy, but, you know, like, again, with the Gwyneth Paltrow kind of wellness trend uh, and, and all this kind of world, is like he said, <laughs> everything is just like a adult childcare. So we have this thing of like, oh my God, we have to continue to reflect, oh, was I abused as a child? Oh my God, you know, what kind of thing? And now how, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying, uh, how aware of this idea are we about, you know, what, what is childhood? I mean, you know, nowadays it's, it's very fascinating to, to contrast uh, different societies. Like when I go to Asia, even in Germany, it's very different to America. Uh, what is considered adult behavior, you know? And, and now we, we have this, uh, what is the word? There, there is a word, uh, uh, neoteny. You know, this concept of neoteny, it's in biology. It's the preservation of childlike characteristics. So again, if you look at fashion, if you look at uh, image, you, it's, it, there's a lot of things to, to same as all this, uh, TikTok or Instagram uh, filters, you know, to make your eyes bigger, to make innocence, you know, because this is, again, part of the kind of uh, neoliberal uh, need, right? Because 
we need everything to be more docile, friendly, nice, so we can make nice movements. But I would argue this is the is a, a kind of, again, another form of disavow of responsibilities, of self-agency. You know, if everybody is just innocent and easygoing, then it's easy to control and uh, move and manipulate. So this is my thought on this uh, thing about the the child and uh, yeah, this it's fascinating. So Ayoto, uh, I guess l last question, uh, unless uh, uh, you have more time. Um, uh, I was uh, curious about uh, how your personal research therefore is, is proceeding, but I see you are continuing to show some images, so I anticipated probably something you wanted to add. Oh, the, the, no, it's just being my ADD clicking. Is, but yeah, I can talk. Yeah, I mean, since since doing photography, in fact, I mean, it's interesting because the for photography, you know, the natural progression for a lot of photographers is to make moving images and to make film and so on. And part of that research was to get into more about writing and to understand also psych psychologically uh, understanding literature and, and this kind of thing. Yeah, and together with sexuality, I mean, yeah, last year I, I made a film called My Film with Andre or How I Learned to uh, Stop Worrying and Document a Sex Party. This is something I did after lockdown. And this, you can see my film with Andre. This is the film and this is some posters that I made uh, where I was kind of going directly against the direction I was going before. So I made the film with just the phone because A, I, it was still kind of weird lockdown world and not really the money behind it. And I realized the other problem with uh, exploration and money is that, and I got quite good at it, you know, finding funding well, in the American world where funding is not like in Europe where there is a more government body and for research, pure research itself, but rather about how can people commoditize it, commercialize it, and so on. So, you know, I can find uh, that that was the really depressing thing for me to to make a project with Apple. And, you know, we spent one million dollars in one day to make some fucking photos to, you know, to sell some some stupid, stupid products. Uh, but to to make a film or to make research that cannot make money, then suddenly nobody's interested. So I made this film because at this time, yeah, I, I particularly like this poster. So let's see if I can pull this up. Because, yeah, here we go. Um, this idea was because there was these two Romanians that I met and uh, was very interesting during last year because this was uh, before the kind of boom and collapse of this particular round of uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And I met these Romanians and in a way they were the most furthest of the fringe compared to what I was coming from in New York, right? Where it was very much about the materiality, the, the commodity fetishism. And these guys were completely outside of that. I mean, you know, look, it was the summer, but they were pretty much naked most of the time. And uh, they, they are, well, this is not the Romanian, but this is another German Fabian. But him, he, it's the story is about my film with Andre. And Andre, with another Romanian they were very much obsessed with body and uh, body explorations, uh, but more from the self-improvement world, but in conjunction with cryptocurrency. And uh, I, they agreed to uh, make a documentary about them. And the reason I did this was, well, many reasons, um, but one was that, again, last year, the beginning of last year was the kind of height of Asian hate crimes. And I wanted to talk about this with my really close friends. But I realized many of my friends, uh, not all people, but many of the white friends could not hear this experience. You know, like I was not saying, hey, you are racist. I say, hey, I'm receiving crazy amount of violence and, you know, attack. And I want to talk about it and my frustration. But it was a shocking experience where they just ghosted me. They could not hear it. And of course, then I started to make a podcast and about these things and, and did a lot of research and readings. But then I realized that the people who were interested to listen and to do it, they were already maybe Asian or understanding the discussion about Orientalism, about colonialism, blah, blah, blah. So in a way, it was kind of boring because they already know there was not the influence. For me, it was interesting to 
understand how to incorporate and discuss this kind of topic with a larger audience where it will really make a difference. I, I was not interested to talk to other Asians who already know this. I mean, that's great and all, but we can all cry at home and hug each other. But I realized through this, this is a way, maybe a, you know, detonement, like if you talk about theory, this is a way for me to take over a discussion like this, you know, through cinema, through cryptocurrency discussion, through sexuality again, you know, and that's also what's fascinating about fashion too, that I loved from the beginning that is again, used the, is, is like uh, the promise of sex that then deliver a different message. So here they wanted to make a sex party. And through that, I also learned from, you know, the, I met Agnes Vada one year in China and um, she made this a fantastic film called uh, Documenteur where she also discusses and uh, looks at and the, the, the idea of uh, self-objectification. Here I was looking at them, but actually it was a way for people, forcing people to unconsciously look at me looking at them and through the promise of sex and discussing about it because they were all very much exploring sexuality, exploring body through crypto uh, just before the crash. And I was very dubious about the whole thing. And so this is my, my, my process. Since then, I've been taken further in the sexuality world because it's become, in my opinion, also very uh, confused in many ways. And, and we can play with the critique uh, all we want. And so now I'm writing a book called uh, Zen and the Art of Squirt or the Sadness of Pleasure, where I discuss uh, and look into, you know, I, I like very much the Lacanian idea and theory about the uh, object A ah, or the cause, the object cause of desire. So looking at fashion and looking again at desire and, and all of these things, what I realized through my life, there was the kind of desire for freedom, no? And desire, like what is pushing for all these different research? And I could come up with different stories. Ah, yes, I was uh, a colonial subject. Yes, uh, I, I was oppressed. I was beaten, blah, blah, blah. You know, these are my trauma victim stories. But the, the thing was I discovered as I kind of one by one, quote unquote, succeeded. No, like I want to be a photographer. I want to be a great, respected fashion photographer. I want to explore sex. I want, to, you know, I, in, in a way, this is what I said before, like the great disappointment is not getting what you want and also getting what you want. And in a way, I got all of these things and I realized, shit, you know, it, it, it didn't solve anything. And now with, again, like Gwyneth Paltrow, <laughs> I apparently very much love Gwyneth Paltrow, and her goop uh, empire, that there is this desire, this promise, you know, this promise of sex, the promise of joissance, the promise of everything. And in a way, in a world which we supposedly have access to everything, it seems that we are more suffering and in pain than ever. So where do we go from here? Where, how do we understand all of these things? One of the most interesting em embellishments or the kind of, Resemblance of this is this idea of squirt. I mean, on a very banal uh, and also level, uh, the idea of ejaculation. But this is where I found very interesting because it's in a way we are, we should talk about sex, but never about sex. And to actually go in there and to discuss it. So I started, this is my current project. It's a kind of actually a large play of conversations of different people. I talk to right wing conservative people. I talk to a gay monk. Uh, I talked to an evangelical Christian in America about the idea of squirt and their idea of it. And again, it's not about the squirt itself, but rather it's a kind of uh, literal manner, example of uh, excess enjoyment. You now, like the complete uh, squirt uh, splash, you know, the, the total enjoyment uh, of sexuality or the image or the idea of representation of that. And it seems that we are actually in living in bliss already trying to create restrictions. And this is what I was interested in also the idea of freedom and bondage that we are creating all of these problems in a way, because if we've learned anything from psychoanalysis is that we're not looking for happiness. This is some of the things and some of my conversations uh, with uh, the AI also the idea of looking at the idea of excess enjoyment and, and squirt and, and so on. And so 
uh, in the book, I'm also exploring uh, hydroelectricity. I go to I go to Switzerland to look at hydro power and the the philosophy behind this. But this is yes, this is the the ongoing work that I am doing. Uh, hopefully, I will finish the book by this year. I also have a very last question. It is uh, an honor from the students. Um, I know you before uh, your work for uh, Melissa, and um, so your 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 research and your approach uh, first to visual art and now to a wider. Um, uh, subject mm, more connected to philosophy and to studies and art in a, in a more specific way, like exploring more what what is art. So, um, but still, I can recognize uh, I recognize your identity. I mean, from the very very beginning, like the first experiment uh, that you made, uh, the, the first shooting on the road uh, uh, that we made together. Uh, very um, immature in a way, if you, uh, if you permit me to, to say so, to your work for Melissa, which was so um, formal, so so related to what is uh, pure aesthetic, and now to something that is uh, um, more a stream of consciousness, more something that goes uh, in depth uh, into human. Uh, uh, into the human being, but I still recognize the you in every work. Um, and so uh, this is more than a question, it's like if you have any suggestion for the students, because yesterday we talked about identity, they are here to, to prepare for the final work, so basically they have to find who they are and how to express themselves. So um, I, was, um, I would like you to, to, I mean, to suggest them how to to, to, to be free to find their way and to express it uh, in, the, in the way they want, basically. Uh, so I think you're a very good uh, <laughs> example of it. I, I probably, you, 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 don't need, you don't do it on purpose, but your personality is so strong that appears in the, in the aesthetic composition of what you do, whatever it is. Yeah, th this is a very, I, it's, I mean, yeah, it, it's, I appreciate you to, to notice that, uh, which is also at the same time a bit disturbing to, to recognize the recognition in the other. Uh, but regarding freedom, for example, I'd like to think of Hegel's idea of freedom, which is to incorporate uh, understanding of history. And as you said, like this period that I worked with Melita, and of course that was very much a collaboration and conjunction with a different person. But of course we could also argue that there is, uh, especially from my side, very much from working on the image perspective and the psychological aspect of it is very much a product of maybe myself. But what does that mean? This is a funny, a little funny anecdote I was in Sweden with my partner. Her uncle is the head of the Wagner Society in Sweden, and already as a you know a student of colonialization and thinking about the historic historicity of Wagner and what does that mean for fascism and so on, it was a bit disturbing. But uh, they are supposed leftists uh, anyway. We we'll talk about music, and uh, I, I also make some music uh, also for my film, and he is this older gentleman and he has he's very excited to share with me his seventy thousand uh, dollar sound system and he loves to listen to classical music and myself i'm also trained in 19th century european romantic uh, classical you know i was playing in the orchestra i i, I was the first chair violinist in the state orchestra i, I play piano but when i understood the history his story behind that and the colonialism behind that was very frustrating. At the same time, it is not something that I can escape at this point in my life, no matter how much psychedelics I take or electroshock therapy to get that out of me. That is me. This is my identity. But uh, as a provocation, this uncle of my partner, she, he said, he listened to my music uh, with respect. And he said, well, it's very beautiful. And he said, I can see the importance of the red thread that comes 
through this and he says he understands. And there's a part of me that infuriated me. I was very upset, very angry because in a way, <laughs> what does it mean for someone who is trying to make uh, for myself a sense of freedom, uh, an anti-colonialist music? Because this music I made, in fact, I did after I made a film to document my family in Taiwan and to look at myself. Uh, this is the process in which I changed my name. And uh, I, I was documenting on the road. Uh, this was another failure, which is a common theme of my family. I document the film, but at, the, at, at this point in time, I have not able to face the image, to face my identity, to face my family, because I've been so conditioned to uh, look at the global North aesthetic to be European. And, you know, deep down inside, I'm very European uh, because my whole life I've been training for this. So I made this music. In fact, uh, I found a bunker in Tokyo where it's just a room with a grand piano. And it's made, they made, it was very fascinating architecturally. They built, they put the piano and built and closed the concrete around it. And they have a tiny bed. It's like a, like a monastery for me. So I went in there and I drove around Japan and I cried for one month uh, with all the pain and release, you know. And I, and I made this music and I, I made this album. And then this man, the head of the Wagner Society, wanted to congratulate me and say, it's fantastic. It follows very much this red line and lineage of Western music. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> you know? It's like trying so hard thinking that, you know, there's a funny story of, uh, in Buddhism. The, the, the journey to the West it has nothing to the West as we know now, but uh, it's, whatever, it's an Eastern mystic story. You know about uh, Dragon Ball, you know, this uh, Dragon Ball character uh, with Goku or whatever. But this is uh, coming from a mythology uh, about Buddhism. So this monkey was supposed, this monkey was born from a rock. He's like a monkey god. And he's very, he's, he's a terrible monkey, uh, but with a lot of power and a lot of arrogance. And he was uh, destroying everything. And he went into the heavens and destroyed things. And he stole the peach of life so he could live forever. And he also found this cloud. And so you see in Dragon Ball, he's on this cloud. And this is all from the myth. Anyway, then one day they said, uh, Oh my God, this monkey is just a nightmare for everybody. Uh, we have to discipline this monkey. What shall we do? And so they, they decided they have to go talk to Buddha. And Buddha uh, did this thing where they said, Okay, monkey, God, I will do a race with you. And let's have a competition to see how far we can go. And the monkey king said, Oh yeah, fantastic. With my cloud, I will go so far, so fast. So the monkey king went on the cloud and, and flew forever to the edge of the universe. And he arrived and there's this like uh, five little pillars, mountain things. And he graffitied on these five pillars and said, Monkey King was here. Yeah, uh -huh, suck, take that Buddha and flies back and says, ah, yeah. And he was telling everybody how far he went and la la. And he says, well, where did you go Buddha? And Buddha said, uh, oh, you went to this five things. Do you mean these five things? And what discovered, what they discovered was this five things was just the fingers of the Buddha and that the monkey king and everybody realized that after all of this, he only, he never reached beyond the hand of the Buddha. And so in a way, you know, my, it's like this idea of uh, freedom to uh, think about Hegelian idea of freedom to, it's important to look at the history and it's important that people for myself and for, for you to look for your own freedom in your own history, whatever that means for you, which has nothing to do with me, but in a way it does also. But I think it is interesting and, and important to look at that and, you know, and ask yourself, is your search for freedom and your search for meaning and your search for whatever it is you're doing to try to come to some awareness to ask yourself with true honesty, are you just doing this because of some, you know, what is the narrative you're telling yourself? But probably, I mean, I like this, I'll end with this quote. It's like, you know, you're in this tunnel and you're going to the edge, to the end of the tunnel, and there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But be careful. Sometimes the light at the end of the tunnel is just the light of another train coming towards you. Thank you, Thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, your, uh, your journey, your, uh, your answer.
energy, uh, your visual research, uh, and also for sharing this uh, last uh, uh, suggestion, which is uh, very powerful, I think. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, uh, Good luck, everybody. I, I really want to thank you personally for your availability and your uh, open heart. It was a pleasure. The new generation as well. <laughs> yeah, we need you, everybody, to, you know, it's important because I, I don't think anybody knows where anything is going. And, yeah, it's an intense time, but exciting also.